There we go. Lucidia is a global software developer with a commitment to providing purpose-built collections management systems to galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. Argus is our unrivaled web-based CMS for museums of all sizes and budgets. Argus is engaging, immersive, innovative, essential. Museum Collections Management, limited only by your imagination. Argus. Let me turn this on. How do I unshare? <laughs> the tech guy should know how to unshare, right? <laughs> It's been a week, huh? Yeah. <laughs> we can just talk like this, watching the screen of Argus. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's see. Well, so I guess um, I will turn it over to you. So you can start. Whoever's going to screen share first, you can you can start. Well, I'm just talking. Okay. Well then, we'll leave that up while you talk. How's that? All right. Well, welcome everyone. Welcome to our session. This session is entitled S Accessibility for Online Programs and Communication Channels. I am Susan Robertson. I'm the ED of Gore Place in Waltham. As we get started, please let us know where you're watching from by using the chat. And while you do that, I will give you introductory information for this session. It is being recorded. It does include live captioning. To access captioning, click or tap the CC icon in the bottom of your Whova window. There is a handout, a terrific handout for this session, and you'll find it in the conference handouts in the resource area. There will be no small group discussions or breakout rooms as advertised, but we do invite you to continue the conversation informally in an after session gathering at 3 p.m. on Whova Find the link in the chat or at the community tab under meetups and virtual meetings. And before we begin, we feel it's important to provide a disability justice acknowledgement. Disability rights activists have long worked to develop and gain access to the very tools we now rely on for remote working, learning and communicating. In acknowledging this lineage, it is important to also recognize that people with disabilities are often denied access to this accommodation for employment and participation. We would like to honor the disability activists who continue to push for inclusion by design as outlined in the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990. This acknowledgement will be in the chat along with three links to learn more about the past, present, and future of disability justice. The other speakers for this session beside myself are Charles Baldwin, Program Officer for the Universal Participation Initiative, affectionately called UP, at the Mass Cultural Council. Emily Carpenter, President of Tunnel 7, which designs and builds accessible websites, and also supports clients with SEO and digital marketing services. Uh, Tunnel 7 is a sponsor of this conference. Thank you very much, Emily. Uh, the next speaker will be Aaron Raleigh, volunteer coordinator and UP initiative coordinator at Gore Place. And Emily Robertson, owner of Studio Robertson, who leads marketing initiatives for Gore Place. We will cover four topics, then we'll leave time at the end for questions but we welcome you to put questions into the chat and we will try to answer them as we go. The four topics. One is how universal design features can transform digital offerings for all visitors. Then we will move to how to convince your key decision makers to invest in accessible improvements. Then how to improve accessibility of websites. And finally, how to improve accessibility of social media channels. The first two speakers on the first topic are Aaron Raleigh and Emily Robertson. Take it away. Wonderful. Actually, Thanks. I just want to cut in, Aaron, before we start. I'm not, for the speakers, I'm not able to access the chat on my phone. So, Doug, I'm hoping you're able to read when we do get some, some chats and some Q&A. 
um, that you can help us in that way. Can do. Awesome. Thanks so much. All right, take it away, Aaron. Okay, so let me just share my screen. And turn you present. There we go. All right. Um, hi, folks. So I'm Aaron Rahoy, and uh, I wanted to give a little information about why accessibility is important on online communications. Um, so 26% of American adults live with disability currently, and that breaks down into 13% who have a mobility disability, 5% who have hearing disabilities, and 4% who have vision disabilities. But 100% of your visitorship will have a disability in their lifetime or know someone who does have a disability currently. Aaron, I think that last point is really profound, actually, because it really, th this work that we do to improve accessibility is really for all of us. It's not just for one group of people. Would you say that's true? Yeah, I would definitely say that's true. And so when we're thinking about online communication, we want to put these principles of universal design um, to practice. So your online offerings should be equitable, flexible, simple, have perceptible information, tolerance for error, and low physical effort. Um, just to give a little personal background, I am visually impaired. I use a um, magnification software called ZoomText, which enlarges the screen and also has a screen reader function. Um, I typically use white text on a black background, which is what I'm using now to actually read this presentation. Um, so when websites and other webinars are not accessible, it really shuts the door on myself and other people with disabilities and also shuts off potential revenue that you might make from these webinars. Um, just to give a little more information, what, what I look for is all text for photos and um, captioning like we have today, as well as verbal description or audio description for um, webinars. Aaron, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about screen readers. I, I wanna make sure yeah, everybody understands because sure. we're gonna talk about them a lot today. And when you use a screen reader, is it actually reading everything that is on the page, uh, let's say a web page? So it would read um, whatever text is on a paragraph you would select, or depending on what software you use, you could select the entire page. Um, so it reads out like paragraph by paragraph sometimes. Got it, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And Aaron may not tell you this, but he was disappointed this week because some of the webinars used visuals that he was not able to read because oh, yes. of the colors <laughs> or contrasts that were used. So when speaking about webinars, um, this is a recent webinar that we did in April for our 33rd sheep shearing festival. So on the bottom here, I'm not sure if it's cut off. I think if you move your mouse set all the way to the right, Aaron, I think that might help a little bit. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so um, there's captions below. And also, um, I don't know, can everyone see the CV photo on the middle of the screen? Or is it inverted? No, it's, it's correct. Okay, uh, I'm using inverted colors, so hard to tell. Um, and so for webinars, we typically ask all of our visitors, if you need an accommodation um, to more fully experience any program, please let us know. That, that's how we can try to meet them at their level. And we usually, just to kind of emphasize, emphasize what Aaron's saying, we actually put that into the, the ticketing page. So before you buy your ticket to a program, you actually get that information as part of your, your purchasing process. Yes. Um, and just a little talk about ASL interpretation. Um, ASL, or American Sign Language, isn't fully compatible with English. Um, it's its own separate language of its own idioms. Um, so a person who 
the first language is ASL may not necessarily understand or be able to read English fully. That's why, for example, if you are creating a program for the School for the Deaf, then you might want to think about using ASL over captioning. Um, captioning is more universal, though, for all visitors. Um, Emily, do you have anything else to add about that? Yeah, I would say with the interpretation, I know today, if you haven't had a chance for everybody who's watching us to turn on the closed captions and actually watch them, click the little CC icon on the bottom of your screen and just give them a try. These are actually live captions. There's a real person. We, we greeted him when we were getting ready to start the session today. Um, and he's a live person actually typing in the captions as we go. That's what live captioning is. Um, it's really easy to make happen. And you can do the same thing with ASL interpretation. You can actually bring an ASL interpreter into your live webinar and they would appear in one of the video windows um, if you're using Zoom or another platform. And that actually can be part of the experience if you wanna reach people that um, use ASL as their first language. Um, and I might add a, a note in the chat, um, just asking for clarification about uh, white font on a black background. If you mm -hmm. could give a little more insight into that. Okay, um, so I typically use white font on a black background because it provides more contrast. Um, for example, yes, uh, a few days ago, one of the pre presentations I saw had very blocked letters and it was a white font on a gray background. I couldn't really tell the difference between the background and the font. Um, so typically what I would use is a sans serif or Times New Roman type font um, to make it more clear. And I would not use all capital letters. I would use the uh, traditional combination, both capital and lowercase letters. Are there any more questions for any of us? I think if we're waiting for there's another question, Aaron, I was thinking, you know, we, you and I could talk a little bit about, um, you know, it's so important, I think, as the pandemic has been going on and so many um, experiences have been moving to these live webinar formats mm -hmm. that we want to be able to um, remove those barriers to access and inclusion to, um, for all people to be able to enjoy the experience, whether it's in person or online. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, and I, I gotta say, having a virtual program even it spans it out to people who can't traditionally get to your physical location. Um, I mean, we had people coming from as far away as Hawaii, so someone who can't, maybe not be able to get in your front door can get in your virtual front door and see your programs and experience your museum more fully. It's really true. And I think in particular with captions, something I wanted to mention about captions was that really everybody uses captions at some point in their life. If they're in a crowded bar or a busy airport and they need to be able to see what's being displayed on a screen and they can't hear it, they can read the captions. All of us have been in our offices where we have something on mute and we can't listen to the audio, we're reading the captions. Um, so it's used by all people, whether they, you know, are deaf or hard of hearing or are just in a crowded place and need to be able to read that. And so it's a, it's a really excellent and really easy solution to make your live webinars more accessible. Okay, Emily, you have one minute. All right. Okay. Wonderful. Aaron, did you have any more slides here? Uh, no, but that's, that's the end of my slides. So okay. I didn't know if, yeah. Let's see if we had any other questions. How are we doing, Doug? So right. far, so good. Okay, wonderful. Um, yeah. I, one point here, I have always been told for exhibit text to avoid light text on dark backgrounds, but it sounds like this is different for the web. Would that be, would you say that's the case? Huh. Um, I would say it depends on personal preference. I mean, I'm just telling you what, I, I prefer light text on dark background or any contrast in color on the color wheel, basically. Um, but there are other resources out there that can tell you uh, specific contrast fonts and colors. Yeah, just to follow up with what Aaron said, it's really about the contrast. So a dark background with light text is okay, or a, or a dark text and a light background can be okay. It's really the contrast between those two color choices. That's what you wanna make sure you're taking care of. And there are a lot of resources. Definitely reach out to us after the session and we can point you uh, the way for exhibit um, design resources. 
Okay, the second topic, Charles, you and I, we're going to talk about how to convince your key decision makers to invest in your accessibility improvements. You're muted, Charles, we can't hear you. <laughs> I'm gonna jump right in, uh, but I am going to start with, uh, I'm Charles Baldwin. I do lead the Universal Participation Initiative at the Mass Cultural Council. I'm an older white gentleman with glasses and a beard, shaved head. Uh, today I'm wearing overalls because I'm headed to the farm at Gore Place. <laughs> and I like to use that as an opportunity when we're talking about descriptive language, it can sometimes be as simple as describing myself. So when you hear my voice, you have an idea. Uh, and that's for anyone who might just be on the phone in these virtual meetings as well. All right, Susan. So yes, our topic is how to convince your key decision makers to invest in accessibility improvements. Mm. And it's true, I sometimes, you know, I have my own tactics. Uh, and so why don't we actually explore that? When I took over this program four years ago, you were one of the first people I reached out to based on friends loving Gore Place. So they were like, oh, Charles, you gotta get Gore Place. And I reached out to you early, probably 2016, maybe 2017. And I turned you down. Day. I turned you down. <laughs> I know. Uh, and why? I wasn't ready. <laughs> Gore Place started into um, hoping to do accessibility a long time ago, about 10 years ago. Uh, every year we do a um, guide training and we decided that we had so many elderly visitors that our guides were really possibly not up for giving good tours to them. So we didn't have any money back then and we, but we wanted to train them and we wanted to train them with outside facilitators. So we organized a series of workshops we had no money, how did we do it? We had to pay the facilitators. And by now, fast forward 10, 12 years, we're part of the UP program. All our buildings are fully accessible. We have first floor bathrooms. We spent a ton of money getting this all done and we're very, very proud of it. But the most proud thing we are is that we took on Aaron Raleigh, who has changed the attitude of all our staff. Having a disabled person with disability on the staff sensitizes it and makes it personal. So my first key point, I have two key points. One is make it personal. The way we got the board involved was to invite a board member to uh, join us in the planning of our workshops. And all of a sudden it became super personal and they took it back to the board and the board early adopters of this and we are where we are now. I think the second thing I would say is because it became personal to the board and they could almost see themselves possibly becoming so arthritic they couldn't walk easily or couldn't see very well as they got older, they wanted to be proud. And that pride made it even more personal. So they wanted Gore Place to be accessible to all. They wanted to be proud. They wanted to make sure we were a destination. They wanted to make sure that the community understood that we were here for them, no matter who, what they were. Well, and Susan, you bring up two really great points and I'm gonna go backwards on them because one, I do sometimes think when uh, someone starts talking about access, they do often think of a person with a physical disability, a visible disability, uh, and someone who might even fall under uh, the identity of that. Um, but we also know that aging itself is disabling. We also know that you have a spectrum of ability over the lifespan, over our lifespan. What I could do at 10 and what I could do at 30 and what I'm doing now at 60, are all very different. Yes. And did that aging resonate with the board? And I only bring that up because often boards are made up of folks who are aging. Uh, our board fortunately has young and old, oh, good. but they witnessed me hobbling around for two years with a cane. <laughs> and it got very personal if they were gonna lose me. So yes, it does resonate with them. And the other thing that I, I 
would also like to unpack. In uh, universal design, uh, they talk about the user expert. And this is a person with a disability who by sheer life experience has become an expert on how to navigate or remove barriers mm -hmm. just so they can participate. Um, you gave a little, and again, no shade because this is a journey to get better, but thinking about the presentations that weren't accessible because the colors were muted or visual images weren't described. Um, and you said that a key part is bringing Aaron into the team. Um, and how has, uh, <laughs> are you making Aaron do everything or? <laughs> Aaron gives the best tours of the house. Really, he's wonderful. And the shock of the of the visitors when they realize they're going to be given a tour of the house. This is a big house. They see 22 rooms. And they say, really? He's blind. Yes, he is. He'll do just fine. Just don't move the furniture on him. <laughs> and I, I think that notion of... Um, the restrictions that people place on people with disabilities or the, uh, the restricted uh, assumptions is so key. And that I think is really why it becomes personal. Um, you get beyond the assumptions and you actually get into the reality. Um, Aaron, I was delighted to have Aaron be a part of the, the UP program, the Universal Participation Program, because like you, it, meant that some of our workshops, we really had to make sure that we were including the very practices that we're describing. So I, another question, now that you've put in this investment that makes your facility physically accessible, you mentioned the bathrooms, excellent, getting into the house, always good, um, but it was an investment. Are you seeing a return? Or are you anticipating a return? This is tough because we're also in the sheltering. So you're not physically open. No, um, however, are we seeing a return? Yes, of course we are. A pride, I told you about that. Um, but we also have Aaron and Aaron had to pivot just like the rest of us did in the COVID because he doesn't want to go out and not be able to see people coming too close to him. He's at risk. Therefore, he stays home. Well, what would he do? A volunteer coordinator staying home. He works quite well. He deals with all the volunteers through telephone or internet, and he keeps adding more, and he comes out and meets them personally. And then he does research for us, tremendous amount of research. So uh, yes, we had to spend a lot of money. And I think I want to put a plug in for two things. One, the UP program in Massachusetts is phenomenal. If you haven't been part of it, you really ought to be. I didn't start out a believer, but I am now. <laughs> Excellent. And, That's a great yeah. promo. Thank you, Susan. Oh, it absolutely has to help, helped us a great deal. But the other thing I want to say is, if you're a really small site, the very little money, there's so many things that you can do to make your site more accessible. You just have to figure out what they are. And yes, there are little grants you can write. That's what we did and for help. So do think about it. And up, if you join up and become part of up, they also can help you find some money. Nice plug. Not sure how our time is, but I've got one more question. Yep. Uh, one of the things that up is always stewarding is this, this negotiation between risk and experimentation as a method for finding solutions. Uh, certainly in this time of video world now, uh, we've all had to make changes. Um, have you found that uh, there's a, a, a little more nimbleness for trying new things, Susan? There certainly is, but I want to also emphasize that part of the accessibility change at Gore Place is the digital, the technical. I don't know all the words, but in other words, our website, our uh, online work, which you're going to hear about, that's made a huge difference. And timing. I mean, the work that you were doing online with digital, just right. at the break of this new, we all live in the digital landscape, uh, certainly put instead your experiments or the risk of that kind of investment into a very solid foundation. Yes. You, time is up. Perfect. And thank you. Thank so, you. 
I'll jump in really quick. Um, first of all, thank you, Catherine, for sharing the uh, link to up in the chat. Um, there's a request for um, any of the other links that were mentioned in the introduction, if they could be put in the chat. So if one of you is able to do that, that'd be great. Um, and there's a request uh, to talk a little bit more about live captioning versus post captioning, if there's a place to fit that in. Emily? Yeah, I'm gonna talk about, about that in my section at the end of the presentation. All right, so we move now to Emily Carpenter and Emily Robertson. They're gonna talk about improving accessibility of websites. Hi everyone. Yeah, so I'm the other Emily here. Um, and I am the president of Tunnel 7. We're the firm that helped um, worked with Gore Place late last year to build an accessible website. Uh, so this, their, their site went live in January of this year. So I'm just gonna share a little bit about our process with that site and then give a few tips um, in terms of thinking about accessibility for your own site. And Emily, uh, feel free to jump in here and there if you have questions or wanna, wanna add something to the conversation. Oh, great. Um, so just to begin, uh, just to give an overview of what an accessible website is, what are we talking about when we're talking about accessibility? Many of you have probably heard of the WCAG guidelines. Um, so that stands for Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. And these are standards that were developed by the uh, World Wide Web Consortium, which basically sets standards for the web in general. And there, it's like the technical standard for creating accessible sites and, and accessible web content. Um, and it's, it's part, uh, there's some other guidelines that are more for developers creating things like content management systems. That's the A tag was mentioned at the, in one of those bottom bullet points. And then also the user agent accessibility guidelines. So together, all of these create sort of the guidelines that rule the, that, um, guidelines for the web. So we're going to focus on WCAG right now, though. Uh, you've probably heard the, the term single A, double A, triple A. Um, so these are different levels of accessibility that kind of build on each other. Um, single A is kind of the bare minimum. You, you're not actually going to get too far in terms of making your site accessible if you go for single A. Typically what website developers are going for is double A. Um, so this gets you a pretty, a pretty good level of accessibility in terms of um, the number of users who are able to to use the content on your site. And then AAA is actually, it's, it's not generally recommended for most sites. There are some types of site content that actually it's not possible to meet the criteria. Um, and the color contrast, we were talking earlier about color contrast. It's the specifications for AAA are, are quite, not extreme, but um, are, would be difficult to meet for a lot of color palettes. So typically we're going for a double A. And then there are these four different principles. Uh, I just wanna mention perceivable, operable, understandable, robust. Uh, these just have to do with kind of the, making sure that everything on the site is um, accessible for, for different user groups. So this is the site we're gonna talk about. This is the Gore Place site. So just gonna do a, a quick little case study. This is an image of their homepage. So we have a nice hero image at the top of the grounds with, um, looks like it's a pretty fall day in Boston in the background. Um, and so just to start with um, a little bit about Tunnel 7's process, and this is probably a lot of web design firms, this is gonna be, <laughs> Uh, th these are going to be things they're going to consider. But basically, we, you know, good thinking at the beginning of a project is always rewarded. So we always spend a lot of time with clients up front defining what the, the goals of the website are going to be with Gore Place or with any client who's wanting an accessible site. You know, what level of WCAG are we trying to meet? And then being really clear up front too about the different types of site content um, that we're going to have. You know, sometimes that will there, something may come up halfway through the project. We'll be like, oh, we realize we need to add this kind of content or whatever, but at least having a general sense. So with Gore Place, this site, copy, vi video, an inter we, were, we knew we were gonna pull over an interactive map from their old site. Um, they needed to have donation functionality. And then there's also, they wanted to have an e-commerce section on the site. So we kind of had that information at the beginning. Um, so just, again, the importance of kind of starting the conversations early, um, we knew that uh, color contrast was going to be really important. 
Um, and for so, so for double A standards, uh, the color contrast, the ratio has to be 4.5 to one. That's the minimum. And so I'm showing three um, of Gore Place's brand colors here. That top one, the light green, you can see the contrast ratio doesn't meet the criteria. Um, so in the, the bottom two do, uh, they're, they're over that 4.5 to one. Uh, so if you look at the site now, you can see we, we made some design decisions here. Um, we use that light green more as an accent color. So it still is in use on the site, but we didn't use it as a background for text, for the white text or anything like that, because um, that wouldn't have worked. Another really important piece uh, we've been talking about is, the, is alt text. So um, this again is text. It's like a, a tag for that uh, HTML tag on the photos that if somebody cannot see the photo, it describes what the image is. Um, so you want your alt text and this, this uh, screen is just showing um, the alt text for that first image, the image of a, the metamorphic chair on the collections highlight page on the Gore, Gore Place site. So um, yeah, for, for alt text, again, just thinking about writing a description, you don't need it to be like a mile long or anything, but writing a description that if you can't see the image, it will give you a sense of what that image is. So actually this one that I'm showing could use a little bit more descriptive descriptor here, just so um, it kind of explains what the photo is a bit more. You do want to keep them uh, all text, you know, like 125 characters or less. Um, so again, it doesn't have to be super long. It has SEO benefits too. You need to have alt text in place or it's helpful for search engines as well. So um, yeah, good to, a very good practice to, to implement having these with all, on all your images. So then another important piece is organizing site content. Um, and so this, I'm just showing here, this is the homepage, um, sorry. This is the homepage again of the Gore Place site. I'm showing kind of the, the overall organization of the page here. You see very clear main navigation items. You see those sub navigation items under about, again, the background color is that maroon purple. And each of the sub navigation items are underlined. So that's an important piece for AA um, to meet AA criteria. Um, and then um, another piece, again, this is, this is kind of just general best practice with, with copy on, on the web, but this page, I'm showing the visit page of the Gore Place site now. This shows the page being broken, the text on the page being broken up really nicely with H2 and H3 headers. So again, that's really helpful and important for um, using assistive, de assistive devices. It helps to organize and, and explain what's on the page. And then we have the videos page. So we knew that we wanted to, um, oh, Gore Place has a YouTube channel and we knew we wanted to embed videos from that uh, YouTube channel onto the site. So typically, you know, it's a matter of taking the embed code from, from YouTube and kind of plugging it into the site. And we noticed we were getting errors when we did that. Um, so we ended up having to manually add a title tag again for these videos. Like if somebody comes to this page um, and is using a screen reader, they need to be able to see or get a sense of what the, each video is about. So we have added, we added some manual, a manual title tag to each video, which um, then makes this page accessible. So just a little sort of custom workaround that we did. And then this is uh, an image of an interactive map that Gore Place had on their old website and they wanted to move it over to the new site. So it's basically, the map is a bird's eye view of the property and it has different points of interest um, on the property that are clickable and they bring up a pop-up. So we had a couple of issues here with um, alt text missing from images and also there were some header tags um, that were, were missing from the page. Um, so this was actually interesting because we, um, when the site went live, this page was fully accessible. And those, those errors have actually cropped up again in the last couple of months. And the issue here, there it was, this map uses kind of an older co code base. And so um, there's just an example that of, it's important to kind of keep, a, to check the accessibility of the site. And sometimes when you're using older co code bases or like a 
pre-built library of code, you may run into accessibility issues and might have to do some custom work in order to make it accessible and keep it accessible. It's sort of like the websites are a living, breathing thing that we have to keep maintaining. Like, yeah, like a exactly. plant, keep watering it. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. So um, you, um, you have one minute before you switch to social media channels. Okay, I'll be fast. Um, the last bit here is just on third party systems. So we do have some e-commerce. Uh, we have an e-commerce set up on the site and this is the shopping cart for, the, for that e-commerce. And you can see there are some errors here. Um, and then there's also, this is the donation um, uh, system that we use. And it also, so it's a third party system and it has quite a few errors. So we are kind of, we were, um, there's just so much you can do when you have, you're working with these third party systems. Um, so just to keep that in mind. And then just a few tips here, um, just again about including accessibility in your conversations up front. Thinking about also re if you're thinking you might wanna retrofit your site, uh, that process, depending on what you're, what's going on with your site, that can be quite consuming and expensive. So I know in Goreplay site, they were already thinking about a redesign and it just made sense to do that instead of and include accessibility as part of that instead of um, trying to retrofit what they had. Um, a word of caution um, around, well not caution exactly, but if you're using a common web builder tool like Wix or uh, Squarespace, you just want to make sure that you're using themes and plugins with those that are accessible. Um, given what a big topic this is, I think there should be plenty available, but you just want to make sure you do that research. And yeah, kind of same pre-built libraries of code. Um, you can run into issues with those too, about them being accessible. And then um, I'll just skip over those last few, but um, these are a couple of resources. If you wanted to check your website's accessibility, um, this is the tool. The second one is the tool that we also have, and that's the one I showed previously with the errors. Um, and then a big tools um, that's available through the W3C website. And there are also audits that are available. There are a lot of firms that do audits, can audit your site for you. We actually do that. And I know Gore worked with a firm to get an access accessibility audit um, previous to doing website redesign. Okay. Thank you. Actually, if I can jump in really quick, uh, Emily, maybe you could address this one question um, uh, wondering about how WCAG relates to 508 compliance. Uh, that's a question. I actually don't know off the top of my head. Um, do you, Emily Roberts? Yeah, so yeah, so 508 is a, it's a, that's a legal terminology. It's a law on the books in the United States, a part of one. Um, and there, for web accessibility, for it's kind of the Wild West right now. There's not a lot of legal precedent or, or kind of language about websites because the original ADA was written in 1990 when the web was sort of just kind of coming up in a commercial way. Um, and so WCAG ends up being really kind of separate from ADA 508 and 504. So, um, you know, Google it, check it out. Um, it's pretty easy to read even for a lay person. Um, and then, you know, follow those instructions and hire a designer that knows WCAG. And okay. I know that, um, that like themes for, uh, for things like Wix and WordPress are often touted as being accessible, but are they rated? Uh, is there a place, is there a, a, a site or something that rates them is another question being asked. Um, I don't know, you'd have to dig around a little bit to see. I mean, I would think they would have some kind of, especially ones that have been used a bit, would have some kind of reviews. Um, you also could just plug your site and then run a, a scanner or something. But again, like the developer that you work with, especially like if you're working with WordPress, having a, a WordPress developer, that we work in a system called Expression Engine mainly. Um, but yeah, you're, a developer should be able to guide you around that. I also want to say about, to follow up from Emily Carpenter, we, Emily and I and Aaron actually did, and Charles, you were there, were you, you were watching, I think you weren't on with us. We did a whole session about this, a whole hour long free webinar for NEMA over the summer. And I believe it's still live on their site, available on their site. So go there, go to NEMA's website and look in their webinars. If you want to watch a whole hour about this topic um, where Emily gets a lot more in depth about how to make an accessible website. I think it's on our YouTube page as well. Awesome. Great. Social media channels. Social media. 
All right. I'm going to share my screen. Thanks, everybody, for sticking with us here on this Friday afternoon. Um, so I'm Emily Robertson of Studio Robertson, and I'm going to talk about social media accessibility. Um, so Emily Carpenter was just sharing with us about our website. Now, our websites we control. We can build one that works the way exactly the way we want it to and make all the features of it accessible. When it comes to social media, it can be a little bit more difficult because we don't control the social media platforms. And let me tell you, if I could control Facebook, I would be very, very happy because <laughs> I would probably do a lot of things differently. Um, <laughs> Um, the, all of the social media platforms that are out there have gotten a lot better over the years at providing features that make their content more accessible to users, although it's definitely not perfect and things are constantly changing all the time and so social media managers really need to be on top of that in order to stay kind of relevant and current with what, um, what features are, are available. So I wanted to cover what I consider my three keys to accessible social media. So if you remember nothing else about what I'm talking about in the next 10 minutes, so these are the three, point, three, point, three key points that I hope you'll hang on to. The first one I'll cover is captioning your videos. Next, I'll talk about writing post text that is easy to read for everybody, whether they're using a screen reader or not. And then finally, we're gonna actually learn how to add alternative text to your posts, and we're gonna practice writing some alternative text, so get ready for that. Um, so someone had a question about captioning your videos. Um, I'll talk a little bit about open versus closed captioning. There's a lot of history about captioning coming up in the 1970s and beyond. Um, open captioning is the kind that's burned in, so it's permanently on. The user cannot turn it on or off. It's kind of becoming, I think, less common. Closed captioning is very common today. It's the kind that the user can turn on or off, so it's not burned into the screen. So usually when people say closed captioning, they really just need captioning today, because in most platforms, um, users have the ability to turn the captions on or off, just like we can today in the Zoom. You can turn your captions on or off. Um, captioning can appear in live videos, something like Facebook Live, live webinars, like a Zoom webinar or another platform, and then finally, pre-recorded videos. You should be captioning all of these. If it seems too daunting to do all of them, just pick one. Let's say your museum is producing a live webinar. Bring in a live captioner, just like we have today. We have a human being, a nice guy who's captioning for us. Um, thank you so much. <laughs> And um, it doesn't cost that much money. Gore Place has been doing that for its live webinars and it costs um, us, the service we're using costs $125 for the hour of the webinar. And what's really nice about that is that the captions are already done. They're actually embedded into the presentation and saved as part of the recording. So we don't have to then get the, caption, the captions done again for the recorded version that we put on our website. Um, for live videos, it can be, um, there's a few extra steps, something like Facebook Live. Facebook now allows captions to be embedded into the presentation. So when you go onto Facebook Live, you would need to bring in a third party app um, that will actually auto generate the captions using AI or robotic technology. Um, AI captions can be a little glitchy, they can be inaccurate, but it's kind of better than nothing. Um, and you can also use um, some of those um, human typed services as, as well, as long as you're connected with that third party. And then with pre-recorded videos, um, it's, this is probably the easiest one because it's not live, <laughs> pre-recorded and so you can build it in as part of the production of your video. Um, in fact, these, um, what I've done here, I wanted to mention about leaving room for your captions on your video. On my slides today, I left room in the bottom third, there's no content down there and that's on purpose so that the captions have a place to live. So think about when you're making a pre-recorded video and putting captions into it, gives, leave some space at the bottom where there's, there isn't any content that might be covered up by where the captions appear. All right, I'm happy to take more cap captioning questions later on, but I wanna move on to writing post text that is easy to read. So everybody reads post text, whether they're reading it with a screen reader or whether they're reading um, on their own without a screen reader. And there's a lot of good tips to writing a good, uh, some good post text. You wanna avoid special fonts or characters. And this is because screen readers, as they're reading the text, they are actually reading the words that are on the page and anything else about them that might help to define the word. So if you use italics or a special font, the screen reader is actually going to read out loud the word italics or the name of the font along with the text that you've put in. And so it's gonna intersperse this other content into your post that you don't mean to have there. Um, you don't wanna to write too much all in caps because, for obvious reasons but mainly because screen readers have trouble in interpreting caps correctly. You wanna be careful with the use of emojis and emoticons. I have an example of one here on the screen. Emoticons are the precursor to emojis made with punctuation marks in a graphical form. Um, 
this is a sort of a fun one, actually. If you use emojis in the, your post text and you kind of intersperse them throughout the paragraph of your text, <laughs> thank you, Charles, um, the screen reader is actually going to read the name of the emoji as it's reading along the text. And so, for example, if you put the little popular poo emoji in the middle of your museum's Facebook post, for example, it's actually going to read the name of the emoji. And the name of the poo emoji is pile of poop. So it's going to read that as it's going along. And if you don't want that to be in your post, then you should think about either maybe removing that emoji or putting it at the end of your post. And that is the probably one time in my career that I will use the phrase pile of poop in a professional presentation. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> so being thoughtful with hashtags, links, and mentions, it's really good with your text content to put um, links maybe at the end of your post text, not at the beginning, not in the middle, put it at the end. If you want to mention someone, you're going to tag someone else, putting that maybe, maybe at the end, it's easier for a screen reader. And then with hashtags using camel case, which is when you capitalize the first letter of each word in the hashtag. And I have two examples here on the screen, the one on the left, Hashtag New England Museum Association looks like a lot of text. It's hard to read that, right? It's all lowercase. And the screen reader might read that as Newen Gland Muse UMass Association, which is not what we meant to say. So if you capitalize hashtag New England Museum Association, capital letters on the first letter in each word, it's a lot easier for everybody to read. And there's no cost to doing that. Camel case, everybody should be doing that. It's free. All right, here's an example on Gore Place's Facebook page last week of a great example, easy for a screen reader to read. We've got camel case on the hashtag. Um, we've got a mention for Caroline Wynn photography at the end. Um, and then we have our beautiful photograph, which has alt text in the background. And we'll get that to that in a moment. So adding alternative text to your photos, um, some great tips that, that I want to follow up from what Emily Carpenter was sharing. Keep it short. She mentioned 125 characters is often the max. I think that's probably maximum 20 to 25 words, like at the absolute max. I think that's kind of long even. You want to be even shorter. And you want to be descriptive, include just what's important. You don't have the ability to include everything, so don't bother. And also, you don't need to include the phrase image of or description of because it's redundant. The screen reader is already going to go into introduce the image to the screen reader user as an image. You don't need to include that, and it saves you space. You don't need to use those words. Um, adding alt text actually in your social media platforms is all really similar. Um, this is Instagram. These, uh, there's some screen captures on the left. I have a screen capture from my phone. I've uploaded a photo. I scroll down to the bottom. I can see advanced settings. I go to the next screen after clicking or tapping advanced settings. And I see on the right hand side here, advanced settings all the way down accessibility, write alt text, click that. And that's where you're going to enter your alt text and save and post. Same thing, if, you're edit if you've forgotten to include the alt text, you can go back and edit it. And here on the photo itself, um, I can edit alt text on the bottom right-hand corner there. Same thing on LinkedIn, you want to upload the photo, you're going to see the field for adding alt text, and then you can add it. The right uh, side photo here is where you can actually add. And this LinkedIn is definitely at that 120 character limit, so you got to be short. Um, I wanted to say something before we get to our practice of alt text is that um, sometimes platforms change things. I know with Facebook right now, on my version of Facebook and Business Manager for the Gore Place account, I can't add alt text to a scheduled post. I can only add it to a post that I'm doing right now on demand. Um, so if that happens, if you, if you can't find the field to add alt text where it would live in the background for the screen reader to read, or you're just, you just can't find it, it's okay to put that alt text in the actual post text itself at the bottom, kind of underneath where your main post text is. In that case, I would label it image description or alt text and then include the, the information there. That's okay. So we're gonna practice um, writing some alt text. This is a photo from Gore Place's Sheep Sharing Festival. I'll explain a little bit about what's going on here. This is our Maypole with Morris dancers. It's a English 18th century dancing style. It's the spring maypole and visitors are dancing in a circle and interweaving these colorful ribbons. Um, it's a wonderful part of the festival. So I took a stab at writing some alt text for this photograph um, and I'm gonna cover up so I can see myself here. So I have a little bit of a longer sample, I'll read it. Number one is Morris dancers walk in a circle while holding colorful ribbons connected to a maypole. Blue sky and a brick mansion are in the background. So that's definitely at the longer end, that's probably as long as you want it to be, and that's 24 words. I would probably edit that down. The, I have another sample that I've edited down. Dancers hold colorful ribbons and dance around a maypole. That's only nine words, and it's really getting to kind of the critical points of the things I want that person to know about this photo. So in just a few seconds, I'm gonna bring up a photo. Can I bring it up? Yeah. There we go. And you have two minutes. 
Wonderful. Perfect. So here we are in my last slide. Um, I'd like you to practice writing some alt text right here in the session. Um, this is a photograph of one of the beautiful ewes at Gore Place, our Lester Longwell historic um, heritage breed. This sheep is actually about to be shorn, so it still has its beautiful locks of long wool. Um, and it's, um, I just think it's a great photo. And I'd like you to practice writing some alt text and please drop it into the chat. And maybe Doug, if you're willing, you'd be able to read a few of them. So just take a few minutes and um, just take a stab at it. Alt text is certainly not a science, it's an art. Um, we get better at it over time. Some images are harder than others to describe. The maypole image was definitely one of the harder ones. So Doug, do we have any alt text samples to share? Um, not just yet, but okay. um, in the, but while we're thinking about that, I want a yeah. uh, question you can maybe keep in your minds for later. It's been posed, how do you balance updating historic sites for accessibility and historic preservation, uh, as in changing dimensions of a historic home or adding ramps? So if there's a moment to discuss that. Yeah, we actually have a good, we have about 10 minutes for questions. So why don't we hold that one until, okay. until we've wrapped up this section. So let's see here. Um, some of the things I'm seeing, and, and people are adding so fast that they, they scroll up. Uh, <laughs> let's see here. Close-up image of sheep with long wool hanging past eyes. Close-up of Lester long wool sheep before shearing. Headshot of a sheep with a long shaggy coat before shearing. Close-up of head of sheep with long wool about to be shorn. Thoughtful looking sheep with long shaggy coat. A furry sheep looks off into the distance. Detail of the face of a white sheep with long wool in his eyes. You in semi-profile with light colored wiry wool. Adorable photo of a sheep with long hair. Head of sheep with long strands of wool. Face of a sheep with long locks of wool dangling around neck. Side profile of Lester heritage sheep with long locks of wool. Close up of sheep head with well-grown wool. Wonderful. Headshot of unshorn sheep. And lastly, long wooled Lester sheep with watchful eye. All right. Oh my gosh. They, those were so great. I'm so happy and excited for everyone. You did such a great job. Um, those are all wonderful. It's great because this photo is close up. It's, it, it is nice to include the phrase close up. You probably can take out image because it's just sort of extra because the screen reader is already going to be telling the user that it's an image. Um, so you can, you can get that one out. But everything else was great. I love using the word adorable, really descriptive words. Just thinking about that user that's going to be reading the alt text. Wonderful job, everybody. Thank you. Okay, questions. This is your question period. Right. I'll take away the sheet photo, although I guess we could keep looking at it. We had a question about preservation. Yeah, it's interesting about that question because actually this session before COVID was originally going to be a session about accessibility in, in person, really physical accessibility, things like ramps. Mm -hmm. And we decided to switch it to being um, about online accessibility for obvious reasons. Um, but we key, can definitely talk about that. The key to our house in, in uh, inserting accessible features uh, was to do it very carefully and very thoughtfully and to consult uh, experts on the subject we wrapped the ramp into a grassy mound that we built, so you hardly even notice it. But we wanted to bring people in through the front door, so we fortunately have two front doors, so we could use one of them. Then we had to adjust the tour in order to, so the tour would come in that door as well. We didn't want to discriminate against anyone. Inside the house, we very delicately added um, uh, little wedges to all our um, doors um, so that people could pass through on a wheelchair. There are lots of things you can do if you do it very carefully. Yeah, and if you have more questions about that, definitely contact Susan, because she can talk at length about it. Yeah. And I think that's the question that historic sites will always come up with, that idea of the, uh, the physical integrity of the heritage versus the uh, codes and compliances uh, now, um, and recognizing that this very digital land can help bring access to a physical site. Mm -hmm. um, you have a wonderful, was it the third floor or the second floor? I remember climbing up those little back stairs. Well, in order to make the upper floors accessible, we knew we couldn't add multiple elevators that would destroy the fabric and ambiance of the building. So we install, installed a live feed upstairs, uh, but that's a 
a subject for another session or else join us at uh, three o'clock and I'll tell you all about that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, another question, are there any special issues when it comes to online shopping? My Historical Society will be building an online shop this upcoming year. Um, I think the, the challenge with e-commerce platforms, again, is like we don't have full control over them. So you're working with a third party system like Snipcart, like we have on the Gore Place site. So again, I think just doing your research or working with your developer to do research and identify a platform that um, is going to get you as as possible and knowing that some of the platforms just there are, there may still be errors. Um, so that's just kind of part of the reality. Um, but there are a lot of platforms out there. And given that this is such a big, important topic, um, I think things are going to be changing over the next little while. So accessibility and is going to be much a, more. Okay. So uh, this is for both the Emily's. How important was it to know what questions to ask so that Tunnel 7 knew more deeply what Gore Place was looking for. Yeah, I, I think it was super important. The, the, our development process for the new site at goreplace.org was um, extensive. We did a lot of work with our internal team and external folks to deciding what goals we wanted the site to have before we even called Tunnel 7. So we knew a lot about what we, we knew we wanted e-commerce, the interactive map. We knew we wanted this type of uh, visitor behavior to occur on the site. And so we went, is that it? And so that really had you know, little to do with accessibility features themselves, but we were able to come to Emily and her team and, and figure it out together. And I think knowing the questions so that you can work together is critical. So if you're looking at different platforms, know what to ask around access and screen readers and font and size based on a variety of people who can find that uh, visual text is a barrier. I think that's really key, Charles. Another thing we also did when vetting potential um, developers to hire, we looked at all different types of developers all over the country. And it was really easy to kind of narrow the field because we could ask them, tell us about what you know about, about WCAG, about Excel accessibility standards on the web. And Tunnel 7 could talk about it at length and they could show us um, examples of other sites they had built that are accessible. So it was really easy to make that hiring decision. Um, I'll share a couple of comments and maybe you can uh, you can react to them. Uh, Once uh, I will add that ASL interpretation in addition to captions is fantastic if possible. The deaf community is very diverse. Um, the other comment: individuals with intellectual disabilities should also be welcomed in museum and cultural spaces. Yes, and I, I always like to comment uh, when ASL is brought up to remind people that interpretation is the accommodation. And that could be American Sign Language, could be Spanish, could be French. Who is coming into your institution and what are the priorities or the vision of what you're trying to achieve at your institution? But just a reminder that interpretation is the accommodation. I know we have a couple minutes left. Um, we are gonna finish wrap up right at 2.30 Eastern here. You have two minutes. It's, it's difficult not actually being able to see all the questions. I want to jump in. I know. I'm, I'm not seeing any more questions or comments. So, yeah. Okay. Um, well, don't be at this chat at three o'clock. I can certainly show how to use voiceover on a phone if people want to understand that aspect of it. And we do know that this is a big topic and could be unpacked. Uh, the, the, the little pieces that we touch could be unpacked in their own hours. Uh, we will, uh, it's one of the reasons why we uh, created the community event after this, so that if there's an opportunity to dig more deeply uh, with more specific questions outside of the digital realm, there are uh, five of us here who might be able to uh, touch upon that. Um, uh, in closing, since we will be closing on time, uh, also, like interaction, any opportunity to reach through this Zoom screen. Uh, this is also the end of a long conference. 
people have been uh, attending many different sessions. Uh, Susan was acknowledged with an award and congratulations. Um, but as you, as you think about how are you going to activate all those ideas that are now in your head, uh, I invite you to participate in a brief word fall or waterfall. Think about all the things that you have been, uh, that have been put in front of you these, this last week and thinking about what might you activate first. I'm gonna ask you to type, not send yet, but type what you're thinking about, two or three words that are really about how you're feeling right now at the end of the NEMA conference. And at the word go, I'm gonna suggest that those three words that you've typed that we all input them at the same time. So thinking yeah, about all minute. that activation, and I'm gonna suggest a word waterfall on the word go on one, two, three, go. <laughs> all those words are the words of your peers, are the words to be thinking about and activating after this rich week of so many ideas new ideas, old ideas, resurfaced ideas. And I thank you all very much for participating in the Gore Place Digital Access session. And I really thank Gore Place for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Charles, for coming. Emily, Aaron, Hi. and Susan. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Hope to see you all at three o'clock. And go find us in the Whova community section under meetups and virtual meetings. See you Bye. there. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.